in the scripture. And uh, I know that we have some things planned this evening, and we appreciate that. You know, uh, everybody has birthdays, and, uh, but we appreciate that you would take time to think of our family. It's a busy time. We kind of all are kind of conjoined there, right? One right after the other. I guess I'm the grand finale of them. Uh, so, uh, but we, we appreciate that. We know you have things planned. Uh, but we just want to jump into the Word of God. And I want to share a few things. And uh, it's just good, good to look at the Word of God. Psalms 23. I just want to look at verse number one. I'm not even going to read the rest of it. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. I wonder if we were to look at how many of you have ever studied literature and you, you, you know those classics that Shakespeare has, has wrote, uh, like that of Romeo and Juliet, uh, that of Macbeth, uh, the Canterbury Tales, all those literary uh, uh, pieces of work that, that, that we study and, and uh, maybe you've uh, uh, read them and wrote out reports on them when you were uh, in, in high school. Really when it comes to a liter uh, literary piece of, of material from the Word of God, it's all beautiful, it's all wonderful. But, but I have to think that, that probably this psalm has won itself a supreme place when it comes to religious literary work. I mean, just it, almost everybody knows it. It's, it's that psalm that when you read it, no matter what age you are, no matter what race you are, no matter what your circumstances are, you find a quiet beauty just in the words of Psalm chapter number 23. And it doesn't matter what your depth of spiritual insight is, that when you look at it, it brings this uh, uh, place in your soul where it's satisfied and your soul just possesses that anchor of satisfy, uh, 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 being satisfied uh, from, from the, this literary work that, that you read. And so it belongs to a class of psalms that, that, that just brings complete confidence in our Lord. Thank God that we can be confident in Him tonight. Amen. And so the psalm brings that, that realm of confidence and trust that we can have in God. Uh, it brings that consistency of having a strong affirmation uh, that, that God has loving care for each and every one of us, bottom line, regardless. We need that affirmation, don't we? Uh, every one of us needs affirmation in some things in life. Uh, particularly, David gives us that affirmation uh, from the throne room of heaven when he's talking about the care of the Lord. And he could have been talking about uh, the things he was going through in life. He could have been talking about sickness. He could have been talking about uh, the, the, the deep, uh, treacherous things that enemies was bringing against him. Uh, but he begins and he ends with this grateful acknowledgement of of the never failing goodness of our God. Hallelujah. Begins and ends with that. No other details in between. Just the acknowledgement that God is loving and good to us. And so uh, it, it pictures for us uh, the green pastures, the still waters that's provided through God's flock throughout the ages. And he spreads a table for us in the middle of our enemy. And that's for the redeemed down through the centuries, down through the ages. And, and when you look, if you go on the walls of where there were martyrs, uh, they thought about the words of Psalms chapter number 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. You think about uh, there on the deathbed of, of many saints of God. Uh, it's a go-to, Brother David. Uh, that, we, that we say that even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff will they comfort me. It's a song of trust. And, and so uh, we look back and every one of us here, I imagine right here tonight, you could associate something in your memory with Psalms chapter number 23. 
Your story is, is yours. It's, it's a great story. And it's his story that he's writing in you. And every one of you probably could associate something. And there's nothing more sweet or spiritual than the Psalm of Psalms. It's sweet tonight. But yet it's spiritual. And so uh, throughout the centuries, grief, sadness, doubt has driven in the minds of many. But Psalms 23 has given affirmation and drove away grief and doubt and sorrow. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want peace, contentment, the blessings that come upon us when we read this. Really, it's, it's, it's a poem, it's a song. Uh, there's, there's nothing that we could do. When I look at this song, it's almost like I thought tonight, Brother David, after we prayed, Brother Josh, it's just that sweet, quiet calmness of God's presence. The affirmation, Sister Stacy, that He is my shepherd. I shall not want. But I want to look at a few things just in this first verse tonight that the Lord is our shepherd. The first thing that I want to look at is that David, as he writes this, he's writing in his latter years uh, of his life. He is a king. And he says, the Lord is. He had been a shepherd. And uh, he wasn't ashamed of his former occupation in any way, even though now he was a king. He, he wore a crown, but he remembered a time in his life where he grabbed hold of the shepherd's crook. And there it was that he took it to tend and care for his father's sheep. And so he's reflecting upon that time in his life. And, and many would look and say that, that kings were like shepherds. They led the people. They guided the people. And so it was a very good thing to look at. And in fact, later on, the prophets would talk about how the, uh, the, the nation of Israel, they were scattered like sheep without a shepherd uh, because uh, they, they needed God. Or they needed a godly king, someone who would lead them. And so when David wearing this crown upon his head and he's reflecting back without uh, any type of being ashamed or embarrassment, he realized that it was a great time in his life for God had evidenced His power and His wonder and His might to Him as a young man that would lead Him throughout a lifetime that God is my shepherd. The Lord is. And so let's look at that. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is. When we look at the beginning of this verse, the Lord is. It's reflective of really Genesis 1-1 where the Bible says, in the beginning was God. Amen. In the beginning God. Uh, the Lord is. Uh, perhaps the greatest thing that we can look at this evening is acknowledging a creator of our soul who can also be a sustainer who wants a relationship with us because He created us. The Lord, He simply is. And I know that we look at our society, there are many that maybe with an enlightened mind would think in the age of technology and lots of resources uh, uh, man is supreme and man is great. But I want to tell you that we get ourselves in a mess and that's where a lot of folks are in a mess because they think that they are the elite and they are the top. Amen. Well, we get ourselves in a Bible when we realize that there's one much, 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 much greater than I and that is the Lord is. In the beginning, God. The acknowledgement of God. Who He is and the need to yield to Him. And, uh, when we make an observation of God, let me share some very simplistic things tonight. When we realize that the Lord is. Amen. We think about the earth. Do you know it's just the right diameter that it can sustain life? Everything about the shape of this earth because the Lord is. The earth is the exact distance it needs to be from the sun to sustain life. The Lord is. Do you realize that the moon is just the right distance from the earth to sustain life? Everything about the moon controlling the tides, but God has created it in such a way that it keeps the water in their banks that they can only come this far because the Lord is. 
Amen. That's, that's magnificent to think about when we think about all the terrible uh, 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 hurricanes that, that we've seen over the past couple months where the water has gone out and there's nothing but uh, dry, sandy beds or, or else uh, the, 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 the water has come in and done devastation. Uh, but, but on a normal cycle, the Lord is. I think it's a reminder to remind us that God has it all in control because the Lord, He is. And the world, the, the earth has just the right uh, hydrological system that provides the water that we need to, to live and to be sustained because the Lord is. And we look at the oxygen that is created from the world around about us uh, that, that produces the right amount of oxygen for humans and for animals. Do you know why it is? Because the Lord, He is. Amen. The Lord, He is. When we look at that Hebrew word for Lord or Yahweh, amen, it means this. It means Lord, the one who causes uh, 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 to be or to exist. Amen. He is the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. The Lord, the one who is and was and shall be. Amen. The Lord, the provider, the healer, the righteous one, the sanctifier. The Lord, the one who is present. The Lord, the one who is our banner. The Lord, the one who is our peace. The bottom line is, like David, he recognized the Lord is. The Lord is. When we come to that place in our life, and I believe the majority of us here, if not all of us, acknowledge that the Lord, He is. The enemy will try to get you to doubt God, the existence of God, the concern of God. Amen. The world is raging with its uh, uh, all types of theories and, and ideas. If we're not careful, uh, the enemy will discourage us. But the reminder tonight is that the Lord is. The Lord, He is. He is. The Lord, He is. Talk about affirmation to our soul. The Lord, He is. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the protector, the provider, the redeemer, our Savior. The Lord, He is. I want to remind you tonight that He is. In your mind, do you have clarity of knowing that the Lord the Lord He is. He's everything that you need and everything that you will need. Today, this week, ten years from now, should be tarry. Amen. The Lord He is. It's interesting. Peter Cartwright, who was a circuit rider, we hear that word circuit rider. What does it mean? I don't want to take for granted that you may know. Back in the early days of communities being established, as People migrated and settled in areas and built their home. Uh, there were uh, men that were missionary, evangelistic-like, and, and they, they took the horseback and they began to ride and they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, there they would see that in communities that churches were started and, and the right type of leadership was placed there. And so Peter Cartwright, a circuit rider, he was traveling and one night he was going to stay with a doctor. And as he was staying with a doctor, the doctor was very much a doubter, very much uh, 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 did not believe in God. He was very skeptical. He being a physician, uh, just uh, uh, in, in a lot of his own ways, uh, just believed that, that, that God was not. He allowed science and ideology to get in the way of God. Not every physician's that way, just particularly this individual. You, uh, you understand more as I share his testimony. And so he, he said to Peter Cartwright, he said, I want to talk to you about this God who you serve. Let me talk to you about religion. He said, have you ever, have you ever seen religion? Do you see religion? Peter Cartwright said, no, I, I don't. He said, do you hear religion? No, I don't. Do you smell religion? No, I don't, dear doctor. Did you ever taste religion? No, I don't, doctor. He said, did you ever feel religion? He said, yes, I have, doctor. And the doctor looked back at him. He said, I need to tell you, I, I, I am proving to you uh, by the very essence uh, of those witnesses that I've given unto you, your senses, that four out of five of them testify against religion. Peter Cartwright, he 
begin to look back at the doctor after he thought and thought about the things of God a while. He said, dear doctor, I must ask you, have you, have you ever heard pain? You being a doctor, uh, treating individuals for pain, have you ever heard pain? He said, no, I've, I've never heard pain. Have you ever smelled pain? No, I've never smelled pain. Have you ever tasted pain? No, I've never tasted pain. Uh, I, I, and he said to him, finally, have you ever felt pain? He said, well, I most certainly have. He said, well, I need to tell you that four respectable witnesses have testified against you about pain. And so, therefore, I charge you to be a hypocrite uh, working upon gullible people, treating them for pain. And immediately, Peter Cartwright fell to his knees and he began to pray. He said, within a short time, he said that physician began to cry and he was broken as he realized who God was and he realized that God is, the Lord is, the Lord is. Uh, the story is told that this physician went on to take his slaves and sent them back to Liberia uh, out with his own money because God convicted his heart and then he turned into a minister and felt the call of God and began to preach himself. You know why? Because he felt that God is. God is. When we discover that the Lord is, it will change our life. The Lord is. David went on to write, not only the Lord is, but he said the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I love imagery. And I love how the Word of God uses imagery to teach us lots of things. You know, we think about that wise man. He looks smart. He's dressed nice. He's got it together. You see him out there on a rock, and he builds his house. You see it, right? And then you see the foolish man. He's crazy. His hair's flying everywhere. He's confused. His pocket's hanging out. His pants tail, uh, his shirt tail, uh, uh, tucked out of his pants or whatever. And you see him out there. And his, uh, his lumber's all crooked as he's building up on the you, you see it? Do you see it? How about the parable of the sower? You see that guy out there looking like a farmer, but not with a tractor, but he has this bag around his neck and seed. He has a plow and now he's tossing out the seed. And he's kicking up. Do you see it? The God of imagery. Do you, do you think about uh, 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 Luke chapter 15? You think about that, that one that loses the sheep. You see that shepherd. He has 99. He brings them all into where the fence is. And he goes out and he's searching for that one. He finds it. He brings it in. How about the woman with the coin? You see her her little house. And she has a candle lit. She's looking everywhere for that coin. And you know, that imagery, the Word of God does that. And it's very good. We as uh, ministers like imagery because it draws us in and helps us understand. And so David uses this imagery to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Now all of a sudden, you see this guy who, who, who has a, a crook in his hand, and you see that he has sheep all around him. You see that he's concerned. He has a bag, and he has ointment, everything he needs to take care of sheep. Uh, you can imagine him being around where a little pen is, and he's, and he's bringing his sheep in at night. He's taking them out during the day. Later. You see it? You know why? Because David did that intentionally. God did it intentionally to get us to have this image in our mind to better understand God. And so David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Think about that. Amen. We need a shepherd. And here it is that this is painted that the Lord, He first is, but He is a shepherd. Amen. And so sheep are supposed to follow Him. The shepherd leads the sheep. And as we look at this, this imagery, we're guided by it. We find that uh, the shepherd takes the sheep and he has them to lie down in green pastures. Imagine the imagery tonight. Because you and I are the sheep. And God is leading us to a place that is plush. You ever go for a walk? I grew up on a farm and maybe it's my life. And if I can bring that in. But there's some places you go, and man, the grass is nice and plush and wonderful. It almost looks like a very nice carpeted room, beautiful. So you can imagine the grass is green, 
The stream is flowing so gently. The frogs are hopping in the water. The fireflies are starting to fly in the air. As dusk is it. You know, just ever. We've got to follow the shepherd. It's our responsibility. He has been pastors for us. And then he said, he restores us. Do you ever feel like you just need restoration? You know what? That sheep begins to go out, digs around. All of a sudden, its nose is going to get messed up because it's digging around looking for food. But Brother Josh, there's ointment. So he puts ointment on that sheep's nose to take care of it, that it doesn't get hurt. And so he restores them. He guides them. He's with them. He comforts them. He provides for them. He's kind. You know, everything uh, about our life. I believe that God does want to bring good things into our life as He leads us. Not everything as He leads us is going to be the gentle water. It's not always going to be the green pastures, but that's a place that He takes us to. You know, when the water begins to get troublesome, that shepherd will take his crook and he'll dig a little trench out so that the water comes in there in such a placid way that the sheep will go and feel very confident that it can drink because sheep doesn't like water that's ripply and rough. That's the imagery God wants to give us. That He's leading us. And He's guiding us. The Lord is. He is. And He's my shepherd. People need a shepherd. See, the idea that's carried on as well is that in Athens, these Athenians, they would have races. And Brother Wall, in their race, they would be given a torch. This is interesting. The torch. And they would have to run and carry the torch. But the person who got to the finish line first with his torch still lit won. It was diligent work to make sure the torch was still lit to get there, Sister Jenny. And can you imagine you have a torch over there? You're trying to protect the, the fire. It wasn't like it was fueled by gas. And it was a lot different in those days. And, and, and so they're, they were trying to keep the torch lit. And so David says, you can run the race. And you can win with your torch lit. Because we have a ship who is leading us and guiding us. The Lord, He is. And He is my ship. He's constant. He's true. He makes me to lie down. See, we often think that when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we think that that's when someone's dying. You're there in that valley. But I've been there before myself, and I'm still alive. There are times where we think this is going to kill me. I'm not going to make it out of it. It's a struggle. It's tough. They promised that it would be there, even in the valley. Of the shadow of death. Don't fear. You'll keep your torch lit. You'll make it. The last thing that I want to look at here is she said, The Lord is. Recognizing that God is and that He is my shepherd. And then He finishes that verse by saying, I shall not want. God will provide every need in your life. You will want for nothing. Really a better way to say this, if we would translate it, we could say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. There's nothing I'm going to lack that I need. Let me ask you this. If you were without everything, if, if you were taken captive somewhere, you're a prisoner of war, and you're not given anything, just the air that you breathe, you're not allowed to sleep, you're not allowed to eat, you're not allowed to drink, you're not allowed to have any communication with anybody else, and when you come out of being there, what will you want? What are the things that, that, that you'll need? I think I want water. I think I want food. I think that I'll, I'll probably want some sleep. Those are the things that God promised us. That the things that we need, we shall not lack. The timeless truth is this. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. If Sister Beth would come to the piano tonight. <laughs>